And uh, turn with me to, wow, turn with me to Jude, the pamphlet of Jude. I want to start off by saying I really uh, like this letter, and I really appreciate Mike's uh, teaching last week about in the letters of Peter at the passages that were kind of a parallel to what Jude is writing. Remember, uh, to recap, Jude is writing about the problem Peter warned us about, that the false teachers will come. Just like the false prophets arose within Israel, so too the pseudo didascaloi the false teachers will rise among you. And that is the danger of false teaching in the church. Again, if Satan wanted to appear to us in, uh, all in red with a, you know, pitchfork and all of this, we wouldn't let him come in the door. But if he sneaks in and creeps in unnoticed like a ninja stealth person, we have in the church embedded spiritual terrorists. That is what's going on. And that is what has always gone on. Remember, a lot of people think, well, if we could just get back to how the early church was, we would be so pure in our doctrine. We would, we would just have this idyllic uh, picture of how innocent and and fresh and new it was. And, and there was excitement and there was miraculous things going on with the apostles. But there was also, from day one I believe, attacks on the truth of God's word. From within the church as well. Uh, Mike shared with us from uh, Acts 20, where about the Ephesian elders, that men will rise up from among them. Uh, savage wolves will come in and tear the flock. And Paul was very uh, tearful and persistent in warning about false teaching. So once again, that is why here at FBC, we, I think we have a hearty uh, drive to expose certain things that are de- you know, uh, deceiving God's people. And again, the reason that they're able to do that is because they've crept in unnoticed. This leads us to the big question that we have, where are the watchmen? And if we all read the book of Jude, we would realize the importance of calling out false teaching and warning the ungodly that they are not to mess with God's people and mess with God's Word. That's part of it too. But God's people are supposed to, and this may be the theme of the entire book of Jude, contend earnestly or fight hard for the faith that's been once for all delivered to the saints. Uh, God gave us His Word and that's our standard and we're going to see all kinds of uh, ways that that's important for us to be fortified on the Bible. Uh, this is one a, a very exciting subject to me because it gets into angelology, which I, I must confess to you in the last couple of years I've really been looking into a little bit, and I just find it fascinating some of the things that Jude brings to the table about understanding uh, biblical lessons from history. Look at verses 1 through 4. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God and in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you, he says. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, or literally, they came in stealthily, or through the side door, if you will. Okay? These type of persons, says those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. They contradict Him. They refuse Him. They say, this is His Word and we are not going to listen to His Word. They don't listen to the written Word of God. They don't listen to the living Word of God. These people are here to undermine the truth of the scriptures, and they are in the church. So raise your hand if you're one of these people. No, we don't know. Isn't that the truth? Think about what Jesus teaches in one of the parables about the tares and the wheat, right? They look alike as they grow up together, but the root system of a tear is extremely uh, lengthy and intertwines with the roots of the good wheat. So if you tear the tear up, if you tear that out of the ground, what does it do? It uproots the good wheat. But the separation is coming. And that's what we have to understand in the church. God, just like He did in the beginning, He separated the light from the darkness. He's doing the same thing today. He's doing the same thing today. Jacob Prash always teaches he hates the mixture. God detests the mixture. And that's an important thing that we need to understand. The pure Word of God cannot be mixed with false doctrine. 
But nonetheless, as Peter warns, in the same vein here that Jude borrows from, these guys bring in and lay aside truth next to error. That is how you creep in unnoticed. That is how you get in. I heard uh, somebody from uh, a ministry in the past say it's the skin of the truth stuffed with a lie. There's enough truth to get it in there to God's people, and then the venom starts taking hold as people swallow the deception of the devil. That's what's going on here. And these false teachers are instruments of that. And they are good at what they do. John exposes these things weekly with concrete examples out there of what the body of Christ is getting into. And many of us leave here scratching our heads, how could people believe things like that? And yet, it's been made palatable for us. Think about it. It's the lie of Eden, isn't it? The fruit looked good to Eve. She looked at it and went, oh, it's desirable. And so she took it and gave it to her husband that was with her. And there we go. Devil's repackaging the poison apple in every generation. So Jude is saying, we need some people to stand up and fight hard for this thing. I'm going to put my name on the record and say, I want to, as a believer in Jesus, be a warrior for the truth of the Scriptures. It doesn't mean that I go out and, you know, do, get into this crazy, you know, taking territory for the kingdom type thing, or some dominionist mandate in the church that we're to rise up and control everything. It does mean that I'm to be faithful, just like Zacharias and Elizabeth this morning we looked at, to obeying the commands of God. And many of those center on defending the truth of God's word. That's what we're here to do this morning. What I love is, as we've recapped Jude verses 1 through 4, is that Jude here in the next couple verses that we're going to look at gives us three examples in the verses we're going to look at today, of Bible history. If you want to learn about what God feels about something or what He thinks towards something, what do we do? we got an entire heavy testimony of Holy Scripture to tell us what He believes about it. Now, many of us would be quick to point out in the Old Testament, well, we're not under the law anymore, so a lot of those regulations have nothing to do with me. I would say that is not true in the sense that I think they have a lot to do with the church. We're not under the law in the way that Israel was, but there are moral principles of that law that exist to this very hour. And that law tells us what God thinks about things, and we better be very careful what we get into. Amen? I'm going to use a silly example. No offense if any of you in here have one, but I grew up around a lot of tattoos. I grew up around a lot of people that got them. I was in the rock thing, and that's what you did. I contemplated getting a tattoo at one point. Because I was with a bunch of Christian metalheads, and they, some of them had these beautiful pictures of the Last Supper on their back, and you know Jesus and crowns of thorns and everything else. And it came down to a number of places where our band got together and went, well, if we get signed on this particular record deal, then we're going to get a tattoo of our band name uh, somewhere on our body, right? And I'm like, you know, first of all, I'm very grateful I'm not one of the guys that got a tattoo of the sun around his belly button in the 90s. That was like a big thing, and everybody had it. Now mine would be really big, but... Um, <laughs> The bottom line, not only are, you know, obviously the regrettable nature of doing certain things we do when we're young, that was there. But you know what? In the prohibitions in the Old Testament where he talked about not tattooing your flesh, not making markings in your skin for the dead, I don't believe that that has a direct connection to the cultural obsession with tattooing. It's my opinion. Therefore, if somebody has one, I don't, you know, I don't bat an eye at it. In fact, I can acknowledge good art when I see it, and I go, wow, that's a cool-looking tat. I couldn't get one because I was just too afraid that I might not be reading that passage correctly. There's like 10, 12 other things in that same passage that God absolutely detests, and then he lists that one alongside it. So I felt like, wow, can I overlook the fact that he still feels the same way he feels about bestiality and homosexuality, for example, but not tattooing? I don't know. And here's what I'm here to tell you. Again, I don't believe there's a one-to-one correspondence with that, and I'm not here teaching about whether we should get tattoos or not. So John, we're canceling our appointment next week. But here's the thing. What am I saying? It's important to see what God thinks about something. It's important to see what He wants us to be convicted about. And again, I can't make hard and fast rules using the law, but I can say that God's standard is very clear in terms of holiness and The story of Scripture, the stories included in this big, beautiful, unfolding narrative that we have in the Old New Testaments, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from history. 
We don't learn the lessons from history. What does it say? We are doomed to repeat the mistakes and the downfalls that they made. Listen, the Bible is there as an exhortation to us about what God will do to those who are going to be against him. And I got news for you. There is not one place in the scriptures where it is favorable to come against the holy God or his son Jesus or blaspheme the Holy Spirit or trash his word or be a false teacher or a false prophet, or somebody who's a false prophet for profit. You know what I mean? All of these things bring God's judgment. They bring His wrath. And people might ask me, well, do you think so-and-so saved? I get that question a whole lot about certain famous teachers or authors. Do you think they're saved? Do you think they're... And I tell people, you know what? If it's the case that they're teaching false doctrine, I'm going to say this. I don't want to be in their shoes. I'm not making a judgment on whether they're going to make it in the end or not. Maybe they're going through a really bad time and they got into some really bad stuff. That's possible. But if they're believers, we ought to call them to repentance and say, do not remain on this course of false doctrine that you're going on because the Bible speaks so heavily against, in this case, as we're going to look at today, the judgment that befalls false teachers. Now this gets into some really cool deep waters that I'm going to tell you right off are hot issues among some in the church today. And I'm utterly fascinated by some of it because I'm studying it now too. Um, I'll just leave it at that here, but they're calling and their condemnation, the false teachers, we've already talked about that, their damnation that's coming, their carnal corruption, meaning they, t- they take the grace of God and turn it into licentiousness, excuses for what? Wicked behavior. They're driven by their lusts and sensuality. And they deny Jesus. So therefore, there's a reminder that Jude wants to give the church about what God has done in the past against those who are his enemies. And This is where I think it gets exciting. This is also where I think this is a message that the church better embrace. And of course, I would pray that anybody who's an unbeliever watching this or a backslidden believer, and I've met a couple of those very recently, people that are like, you know, I need to get back into the Word of God and go into church and I need to turn from where I've gone. Get back. Get right. Be that person that God will empower you to be in terms of being righteous in His sight. Because if you don't, these things will happen to you. There's going to be three stories here with three judgments, but that's the common denominator is all three of these categories that Jude brings up, you don't want to be in. And you want to also realize what he's teaching about where this stuff comes from. It's not mere mistakes that the false teachers make. I make lots of mistakes, but my heart intent is to uphold God's Word. And so therefore, when I make a mistake, which I think I already did here today, I'm remembering a phrase that I said that I went, oh, that wasn't right, or that didn't come out right. So guess what? Department of Corrections. That will be posted online for those of you who want to see it. Uh, And I'll bring it up when relevant. Why? We're not perfect, but these people have crept in stealthily with the intent to be spiritual terrorists. That is what's going on in the church. Embedded like a cell, waiting to manifest the wicked fruits of deception and division. What does the devil want to do? He wants to sow discord and he's got secret operatives that come in the church if the watchmen are sleeping. I will say this one last comment before we get into the Scriptures this morning. The reason that John and I and Mike teach a lot about the false teaching that we see is to make specific blasts of the watchman's trumpet so that when we go, be careful, when somebody comes in and goes, wait a minute, that's what they were warning about. Wait a minute, that's the materials that John exposed. Wait a minute, that's what's, you know, it may be popular in the church today, but we're sitting here going, hey, what does God's word say? What does the faith once for all delivered to us say? So let's get into this for a moment. He says in verse 5, Now I desire to remind you. Now Peter says this a number of times in his letters, but it's to stir up remembrance because prompted. In other words, to remind you is to remind, to mind you again of what I said previously. See, these guys were broken records. I don't know if you knew this. Just like you know, some of us pastors are. We're saying this over and over. Why? Because repetition is how we learn. In fact, that's very Hebrew to do that. It's very Jewish to do that. When you see it repeated in the Word of God, 
it continues to lay on an emphasis the more it's said. There's also the Hebrew thing, Kalva Homer, light to heavy. If something was said in a certain context that was a warning, well, as the end of days get here, it gets heavier. It, it, it's, it's how much more. Whenever you see those words in our English Bible, how much more? Kalva Homer, it, light to heavy. It's Jesus making a comparison. If something was said in this context, then it was worthy of listen. Now you need to listen to it more. And I'm telling you, the last days make Jude all the more relevant for us to listen to. Look what he says. I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, okay, he's acknowledging, you know, you've been taught these things, you, you know them, I'm not telling you something you never heard before, but he's reiterating it so that we get more fervent about it and we cling on to it better. He says that the Lord, first example of Bible history, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently or thereafter destroyed those who did not believe. Bible history lesson number one, Israel in the wilderness. We don't even have to go to the, the, the passages in the Tanakh about it, but we're going to go to, to summations of that. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 10. Again, seemingly a passage that I always try to work into almost every sermon I've ever done. I don't know why, but 1 Corinthians 10 really struck me. And I think it struck me when I was a lot younger and just saw it as such a perfect synopsis of what was going on in the wilderness. You know, we, I, I used to watch, how many of you watched the Charlton Heston version of, uh, or you heard, oh wait, what, what, what was the Ten Commandments? Who was, was that Charlton Heston? Was it, right? Okay. And, uh, you know, Ewell Brenner, I think, was Pharaoh, right? Moses. You know, and he had this great thing. I grew up with kind of like my life, kind of like watching uh, some sort of a, sort of a second-rate Hollywood teaser thing about these stories. What do I mean? I combined it with some silly times in Sunday school where I wasn't listening, and then when I was, I, you know, I used to draw blood on the uh, worksheets uh, that I got in, in, you know, I'm a pastor's kid, what do you want me to do, right? But I, that's what I would do during Sunday school. I learned to draw blood because there just wasn't enough in the Old Testament stories when they was getting read to me. I'm going, well, this needs to be more bloody, you know. Goliath needs to be spewing brain matter, you know, he got hit in the head. <laughs> I'm just so stupid. I don't know where that's going. But the wilderness is kind of like that to me. I would get this you know, thought in my head that I'm, I'm very sure doesn't correspond to how amazing it was that Moses is leading this nation out. Now, I'm looking forward to picking Randy's brain uh, next month in Israel as we look out over the plain uh, and the areas where, you know, where we'll be able to see some of the wilderness here. And I, I'm praying that I will come back from this trip in February we're taking with a deeper insight about all of this, uh, as well as some really cool pictures, because there's a lot of places I'm really dying to see. One of them is the wilderness. One of them is the how stark, barren, and utterly desolate it was. And yet, spiritually, it was such a proving ground slash the killing fields for so many of the Israelites. Is that, did I say that right, as far as judgment of God? Okay, great. Even better. See, it wasn't that bad. I knew it was. No, I'm just joking. Yeah. <laughs> What's the scary part of the wilderness, though? Not the starkness or the harshness of, of their surroundings. It would have been this aspect. Notice again what Paul writes to the Corinthians, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 10. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, all, ate the, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. There's a lot of midrash going on here explaining the meaning of these actual elements that the Israelites were experiencing, and I love it. Nevertheless, verse 5, here's the danger. With most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. What does that mean? Yeah, the hammer came at them, right? Now these things happened, verse 6, as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be the, the idolaters as some of them were, as it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did, and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Look, acting immorally, 
trying the Lord or provoking His wrath, uh, uh, you, you know, being idolaters, grumbling. I mean, whatever cross-section you find yourself in in terms of your struggle spiritually, well, there was a group of the Israelites that experienced the punishment of God. Judgment because they did these things. Verse 10, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them, Paul repeats, as an example. They were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And then he talks about the danger of falling into temptation. They fell into temptation. They were wayward and rebellious. God killed a lot of them, didn't he? The wilderness is the first Bible history lesson that Jude says to the false teachers. If you're rebellious, if you're acting immoral, and by the way, this is by extension, anybody who follows what the false teachers brought to the table, what happens to them? What happened to Israel? Examples for the church. that We better listen to God and His Word, or there is consequences. Now, we won't turn there. for. The, well, you know what? We will. Go to Hebrews chapter 3. We were in Hebrews so long. Uh, we're always going to be in Hebrews. But Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. <laughs> We know this, don't we? Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as as when they provoked Me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried Me by testing Me and saw My works for forty years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They did not know My ways. As I swore in My wrath, they shall not enter My rest." And then it just talks about an evil, unbelieving heart, the perils of unbelief. Today, if you'll hear His voice, they're provoking God. What happened to them in in the wilderness? It goes all the way to verse 4, 11. But go back to Jude. What happened to Israel? They rose up against God, and God brought the hammer down on them. A warning. Jude 1, 5, once again. I desire to remind you, though you all know, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, thereafter or subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. Lesson number one: Don't be an unbeliever. Right? That's pretty cut and dry, isn't it? Again, Hebrews says, "Beware lest any of you have an evil heart of unbelief. Unbelief is evil." It is not merely, well, I just don't know what I think about something. No, it is in opposition and defiance to faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. And if you're not in the faith, like these false teachers are not in the, in the faith, then you've got condemnation coming unless you repent. Let that be a warning. Anybody watching this, hey, FBC is going to take a stand against false teaching. That doesn't mean we're going to take the perfect stand because none of us have all knowledge perfectly. Amen? But we're going to do our best to sit here and protect the flock of God by saying, hey, these warnings exist for any who want to try and defy God. And I do believe that judgment and damnation will be the lot of many, even those who may be sitting right next to us in churches all over the world this morning. It's just the truth. They're in there. This second group that we're going to be, the group in the wilderness is pretty Simple, pretty much. The second group in verse 6 is to me, of course, the most fascinating one. Uh, Look at what it says here in verse 6 of Jude. Verse 6, a second group. And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode. He, that's God, has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Group number two are the angels who sinned. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're just going to establish our context here. And then we're going to go to the Old Testament to establish a context here. And I want to... Uh, th- this is such a fascinating subject. And I am currently researching it for my own. I'm reading a lot of things. I'm going to read you a few things from sources outside the Bible just for a moment because I want to prove to you a point. But verse 18-20 through 20 of 1 Peter 3, he says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just, uh, yeah, this is it, the just for the unjust, so that He might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, 
in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. I bring up this passage because a big question mark is there. Is this, are the spirits in prison being spoken of here, the same angels that are being punished in verse 6 of Jude? My question to you is right now, I don't know. This may be, as many have interpreted it, uh, Christ going down into the chambers here of Paradise and Sheol or Hades and proclaiming to them victory when he, uh, to preach to the spirits in prison. Doesn't give them a second chance, but he preached to them and said, hey, good news, I'm resurrecting. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't know. But I bring that. Go to 2 Peter 2.4. And then it's going to get really strange. <clears throat> Speaking of those false prophets he's warning about that Jude is saying are already here. Verse 4, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell or Tartarus, and committed them to the pits of darkness reserved for judgment. And then he talks about the ancient world. Noah kind of linking maybe the timing of that sin uh, to the time of Noah. His, his reasoning is, if he didn't spare those guys, he's not going to spare the false teachers. He's not going to spare you if you believe and get you know, led into all this false doctrine and nonsense. But here's my point that we're going to go back to. Go back to Jude. And we're going to read verse, uh, five one more or verse 6 one more time. Angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode. Two ways of saying they didn't stay where they're supposed to stay. They didn't respect boundaries. They did something out of line. And they are kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. There is a specific group of angels who did some sort of specific infraction or sin. And as a result, there's a lot of other angels flying around. But these angels are imprisoned in a special prison under chains of darkness until the day of judgment. Now we all always think about you know, Satan drawing a third of the heavenly host down with him to become the demons okay, that were inhabiting people uh, in the Holy Land all over and all over the world anyway and, and in a growing rate. But here's a group of angels that ain't doing anything right now except rotting away under chains of darkness. Why? Because they did something that was not appropriate because they left their proper abode or realm. And this is where it gets a bit controversial because most believe that Jude is referencing, first of all, Genesis 6. Go there with me. This is, again, just such awesome uh, accounts of things that I confess to you. I, I want to know the real answers of what's going on here. I think it's pretty clear when you look at Genesis 6, the first six verses, I've been waiting for an excuse to like teach out of this passage because it's just so mind-blowingly crazy. Now it came about, verse 1, when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, that the, who? Sons of God, the B'nai Ha-Elohim, right? Saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. And they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. The Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he is also his flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim, or the fallen ones, in Hebrew, were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown, or Rephaim mighty men. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And then it goes on to God resolves to blot out man and to flood the earth, right? Now, of course, when we look at this, we, we realize if you look at the use of Benai Elohim in the Old Testament, predominantly, if not exclusively, I think there might be one other place where son of God or sons of God is used where it's a reference to a man. I'm not sure about that. I'll have to check on that. 
There's plenty of stuff out there to look into that. But by and large, sons of God meant one thing, especially to the Jews who were reading this. Angels. Angels were the sons of God. In the book of Job, it says the sons of God were there in the beginning when He laid the foundation of the earth and they all you know, sang for joy and all of this. And here it looks like what? A group of angels and the book of Enoch, which we do not receive as inspired Scripture. I want to make that very clear. Because it is a mixed bag. There's some really weird, creepy stuff in there that would be considered false doctrine. But there's also some very informative passages that look legit to me in terms of some sort of a historical value. I want to be very careful when I say that because I'm going to read a passage of that in a moment. But apparently the story goes that there was a group of angels called watchers. There's my little watching eyes, right? Who looked down and said, man, those human women are hot. I know we're not supposed to do this because we're angelic beings. But what if we could go down and hook up with the daughters of men? Now, not until Augustine, many, 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 many centuries later, of course, after Genesis is written, he came up with the idea, as far as we know, the first guy to say, well, the sons of God were humans. They were Seth's godly line. And the big problem with that context is in the whole context, there is no godly line. God's sick of everybody except for eight people. All right? And so, you know, the flood is imminent. The judgment of God is coming and somewhere around that time, or before that happened, and then of course some say it happened afterward as well, because you have the Nephilim and the Rephaim after the flood. Go read the book of Numbers, and they're fighting giants. And they're killing guys with six toes and six fingers, and guys that are really you know, big tall guys and uh, uh, creeped out and all this. So, so there was this, bottom line, people believe shenanigans are happening between angels and people. That's hard to swallow for a lot of Christians. They're like, well, how is that even possible? How can you have sex with an angel? And how could you make offspring with an angel? I mean, right? Is anybody here kind of creeped out by it? Some of us would be. My dad was. He really didn't believe at all that angels could do that or procreate. And, and, and there's a whole camp that definitely says, well, that is not angels. That has to be other humans, godly humans looking at ungodly women. And then, you know, somehow their offspring become these other things. Now, here's what I'm going to say, because we don't have, we don't, we, we're not here to discuss or solve Genesis 6 this morning. I would love to teach on it at a, at a later time with a lot more references coming from it. But here's the thing. I'm not super convinced that the Nephilim, the fallen ones, are the direct offspring of these unions. And I'll tell you why. Because it says the Nephilim, and that's I've been unfortunately, by the way, your Bible might say giants. Anybody's Bible says giants? Unfortunately, that's how it was translated in the Septuagint, gigantes, which although the Nephilim as described later in the Old Testament, many of them were giants, Og, king of Bashan, and some of the others, Goliath himself from the Anakim, the long necks, that's what that means. There were all these races of guys that were giants. And I do believe they found massive skeletons. And I do believe there's a few pictures out there that are really legit. There's a lot of hoaxes. And everybody, of course, is saying there's a big Smithsonian cover-up all these dead giants, many of which, by the way, were found in Ohio. Go figure that one out. Uh, we're, we're in the middle of mound-building Indians who definitely had oral histories of giants and, and, and alleged giant graves. Some of the mounds in Ohio have supposedly had giant bones in them. Here's my deal. As neat as all that stuff is, as fascinating as that is to me, I must say what I believe it says very clearly in Genesis 6 is angels had sex with human women. Whether or not it resulted in Nephilim offspring particularly, because it may just be a time reference point. The Nephilim were in the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God did this. Okay, doesn't necessarily to me say that that's the offspring. It said they were already there, these giant beings. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole, is it DNA? Are they half-breed? How does an angel create, uh, how, how do we have the sperm and egg interaction to, to make a kid with a spiritual being? Well, all I'll say is, when angels appeared to human beings, what did they look like? Men, they had bodies. They ate with people, so they had enzymes in their saliva to digest food. My assumption is that these angels could take on a human form and then through that way have kids or have, you know, relations. That's all I'm going to say. We could totally get into the incubus and succubus, the things from the Middle Ages, the sex demons and all of this stuff, and there's a lot of that going around. People claiming more and more supernatural encounters. Pop stars are even singing about it. Having sex with aliens and having sex with angels. Okay, 
here's the deal. As we get closer to the last days, more of that stuff's coming. In fact, many people say the Antichrist will be the offspring of Satan himself with a human woman, thereby being the ultimate counterfeit of Jesus. Man, what a hev- I mean, can you see how crazy this, like, you know, and I say crazy, I mean, I think there's a lot of truth running through here. Very clear. Genesis 6 is about angels and human women. I believe that. I could be wrong, but it really looks like that's what the text actually says. All those scientific improbability or impossibility, that all aside, what does it say happened? What did the Jewish people believe Genesis 6 is about? Most of them believed definitely that this was angels having relations with human women. Now, I'm going to read to you the source material for a lot of teachings about this. And I'm going to just say right off, First Enoch was written in the first century sometime. Uh, it would be called pseudepigrapha, which means a false writing or someone who might claim to be it's from Enoch, but it's not really from Enoch. They don't know who wrote it. Uh, a lot of these things were written and there were tons of uh, letters and manuscripts. But nonetheless, in the book of Enoch, when you read it, chapter 7 says this, It happened after the sons of men had multiplied in those days that daughters were born to them, elegant and beautiful. And when the angels, the sons of heaven, beheld them, they became enamored of them, saying to each other, Come, let us select for ourselves wives from the progeny of men, and let us have children. And an Aramaic text calls them watchers. Then their leader, verse 3, Samyaza, said to them, I fear that you may perhaps be indisposed to the performance of this enterprise, which is a way of saying, guys, we probably shouldn't do this. <laughs> we got a domain here, but oh well. They made an oath, I'm going to summarize for you, on what Enoch says is Mount Armon or Hermon, which is the highest mountain in that area. I'm looking forward to seeing that place, merely because the legend that is so pervasive about what happened on there. Not only was it probably the place Jesus was transfigured, which is my main weight for it, but at the foot of the mountain is, of course, the gates of hell, Caesarea Philippi, where where the god Pan, the goat god, was worshipped. On the summit of that mountain, which is snow-capped part of the year at least, these angels, 200 of them, were said to have made a deal. Okay, we're going to come down on the top of that mountain and we're going to get us some human women. And we're going to make kids. That's the story of the Watchers. And again, there's plenty of citations. I, can't, I don't have time to read all of them, but uh, they were judged. They were then judged and bound. Enoch was told by God to bind Azazel, who was the, kind of the head guy of these things. And uh, by the way, in the Bible, we have Gabriel, Michael, and Azazel mentioned. In Leviticus, Azazel is the scapegoat. He is at least the wilderness demon that the scapegoat is sent out for. So when the priest casts lots, it either lands on for the Lord or for Azazel. And one of the goats gets sacrificed for the Lord, the other one's sent out into the wilderness, which is the realm and the abode of Azazel. And if you saw the X-Men movie a couple years ago, they have a character in the movie there in Hollywood named Azazel. And he's a demon that does all kinds of stuff. And uh, Nightcrawler, the other X-Men guy, is a watcher. He is one of the good angels that apparently is fighting with the mutants against the bad angel Azazel. (laughs) My point is, even in pop culture, these angelic names are coming up more and more. John Zorn, anybody ever heard of him? He's a jazz artist, and pretty brilliant musically, but he has an entire section of klezmer and Jewish music, all different kinds of beautiful Jewish pieces in music. If you look up John Zorn's Book of Angels, He's doing a CD in devotion to each one of the angels listed in Enoch, including Lucifer, including Moloch, including Azazel. And his series has beautiful Jewish music, instrumentals, that are written, and each one of them bears the name of one of these fallen angels. What's my point? People are getting really into the book of Enoch, and here's my concern, again, with the trend in the church to keep quoting these things and to be looking into these things. Genesis 6 says what it says. Enoch says what it says. But we don't have a reason to believe that Enoch belongs in the canon of Scripture, so we have to be utterly careful about the information that we might glean from Enoch. Okay? There is some historical value to it, or else Jude would not be quoting the book of Enoch, which we will see later in his letter. 
So that's why I wanted to do that little long intro about where this story seems to be fleshed out a bit in Enoch. There are details in Enoch that go into how the angels sinned, what happened to them, the names of each of the angels that did this, and what they taught mankind. I mean, there's a lot of uh, things. And again, we can trust some of it in that it lines up with what Genesis 6 says as far as the event, but not necessarily the details. And I would say we, I, 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 would, I have a real problem with looking into Enoch and these other, uh, the myriad of Gospels and, and other false writings that were out. Now, having said that, I'm a student, right? So I'm studying this stuff. I am. I'm, I'm reading a book right now called The Lost Books of the Bible. Two different versions of it. Because I want to see what made certain teachers in the early church tick. I wanted to see what Judaism was like around the time of Jesus. It does offer insight to what they believed about the angelic realm. And I will tell you, it is fascinating. And it is dangerously so for some people. So I don't recommend going out and getting your copy of the book of Enoch. But Lord knows you can find a ton of them because they're, they're very popular right now. That's where this comes from. Back to Jude. Because this is important. What's the main point? The main point is, if you're going to sin like Israel did in the wilderness, God will get you. Physical death is being spoken of there. Destruction in the wilderness. Right? Eternal chains is being spoken of in verse 6 with the, leg- the, the uh, lesson of the sinning angels. They are eternally chained in judgment because they left their first abode and did this sin. Now we're going to even drive that point home in the third history lesson a little bit more even about the angels because verse 7 kind of piggybacks on verse 6. It tells us a little bit more about the angel's sin, but it also brings, introduces the third history lesson, which is Sodom, Gomorrah, and don't miss this, the Plain Cities. Not Plain City, Ohio, but the plain, the other cities that were on the plain that Sodom and Gomorrah was. How many of you heard the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? How many of you know God torched other cities right alongside them? They were all evil. God burnt the place where these cities were geographically located to the point that you are not taking tour trips to those places anymore. You're not going to spend a few nights in Sodom. Okay? But what does it come to be known as? Symbol of perversion and rebellion and judgment. When you meet a person who is proud of being a Sodomite, or as Behemoth, the band, sang last week, I read that horrible lyric to you, we drink the wine of Sodom. They're boasting about it. What did it mean that Sodom drank the cup of God's wrath? It means he toasted them, right? I mean, that's a horrible thing to want to, want to celebrate or do. Sodom stands for rebellion. And so verse 7, just as, third history lesson here, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them. Okay, Since they, in the same way as these, in the Greek, the these in verse 7 goes back to verse 6. The same way as these. The same way as these angels. What did they do? They indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh. Folks, if you're an angel, by nature your spiritual being, to go after something physical is what? Strange flesh. It's a perversion. It wasn't supposed to happen. And Jude is actually linking these two things here. Since they, in the same way as these, indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Judgment, physical death in the wilderness, eternal chains for the angels, and undergoing or suffering the punishment of eternal fire for those in Sodom, Gomorrah, and the other cities. What's the point? They all were united in wickedness and rebellion to God. They all demonstrated not listening to God's commands, false teaching and the belief of the, you know, the, the acceptance and perpetuation of deception to continue their perversion, and it's all rebellion. It's all idolatry. It's all going after something else other than God and saying, I'm not going to listen to Him. I'm not going to respect the boundaries. I'm, I'm going to cast off the restraints of the laws that God has put in place, and we're going to do our own thing, man. And God goes, then I'm going to do my thing, and I'm going to rain fire from the heavens upon you like Sodom and Gomorrah. You can look in your own in uh, Genesis 13.13, Genesis 19.17, 
Genesis 19, 23 to 29, Lot and his family are instructed, hey, get out of here and don't look back because I'm going to rain molten hot judgment on these cities. Lot goes, well, let me go to this one place called Zor, which means little, a little city. And then and the angels capitulated and said, yeah, okay, get your family to Zor, but don't look back, get off the plane, because judgment came. What's the Bible history lessons to the false teachers and those who would believe them, those who would even by extension support, promote, or endorse them? Boom, boom, boom. Three pictures of judgment. Now he's going to follow it up with three more pictures of judgment in the other half of Jude, plus another quote, a direct quote from the book of Enoch. And we'll talk a little bit more about Enoch uh, when we get to that portion. But I hope you can see what I think is extremely clear. And you know, this makes me grateful that Jude would remind the church, prompt them to remember that God is not to be mocked or messed with. And when somebody comes against the faith that's been once for all delivered to us, they are spitting in the eye of God. And you know what? He will bring retribution. He will bring righteous devastation on those who rebel after the same pattern as these three groups of people here. Where do you see America in this lesson? Do you feel that America, do you feel that the church in America needs to be reminded of God's punishing anger towards those who are going to rebel. I think it's a good thing. I think we ought to thank God for putting this in here as a warning. And again, I realize I'm really a gloom and doom, you know, hammer and judgment guy sometimes, but that's, I can't do but what it says in here, and that's what it says. And I love that Jude, you know, brought the boxing gloves out and said, hey, false teachers, this is the deal. So, um, we're going to end there. There's, uh, we'll get into next week the crimes of the false teachers. And, by the way, we're going to learn a lot about why certain teachers in popular media today are obsessed with attacking Satan in a wrongful manner. We're going to see why that is from the book of Jude. I'm very excited to share it with you because I think it will clarify a lot of the stuff that some people are teaching and an arrogance that is dangerously present within people who claim to be Christians if they go after the devil in a wrongful way. We're, we're going to see how that works because Jude warned about that in his day. If there's any questions for the couple verses we looked at today, go for it. <clears throat> Um, what would you um, think of a teacher that would say that the Book of Enoch should be put in the canon, should have been put in the canon? Well, there's a lot of people that would suggest that um, because it seems to coincide in several portions with what the Scriptures have said about certain things, including this Genesis 6 thing would be the most vivid one. That's in the very first chapters of Enoch called the Book of Watchers, and uh, it informs, if you will, a lot of people who speak on angels and these things today. Uh, the movement that I'm speaking of, there's a prophetic circle that's been, and I'm going to say this, Chuck Missler was the first guy that I heard start really talking about this. But you know what's very interesting? I got a book from 1921 the other day called The Spiritual World by Clarence Larkin, who is a famous dispensational preacher, am I right? Definitely a pre-trib dude, definitely a, a dispensational guy. And he, I'm telling you, I read the two pages in his commentary portion in Genesis, and it is word for word what the most famous proponents of that are saying today. L.A. Marzulli, Gan Shimura, Josh Peck, uh, help me out with a few others. You, I know you know who they are. We listen to some of the same people. And I, I, again, I find it absolutely fascinating. But here's my problem. Now... Most of the guys that I hear on these podcasts, and I mean, I've, I've listened to hours of this stuff. Uh, Doug Hemp is another one. Hemp, Doug Hemp uh, from Calvary Chapels. Who's that? Yes, thank you. That was the guy I was trying to remember, Rob Skiba. Uh, look, these guys all teach it, and what I'm hearing today is they'll quote Scripture, a lot of it, and I appreciate that, but they will also quote the book of Enoch, the book of Jasher, and the book of Jubilees, to name three of them, and they now will quote them right alongside Genesis 6 or another passage like Jude here. And they will so seamlessly blend their sermon about it 
that they don't give the, uh, we call it a caveat, right? A warning, uh, that, that, a disclaimer that Enoch has not been considered canon by the church. Okay, at least for centuries. There were some people here and there that wanted it put in there. But for the most part, the Christian church has rejected. That's why we have 66 books, right? 37 and 29, uh, respectively, Old Testament, New Testament, that have been recognized as being canonical and inspired by the Holy Spirit. Part of the reason is because, once again, when you get into the later chapters of Enoch, you have some really weird teachings, uh, which, again, I'll, I'll put a link on the YouTube for that, but it definitely is very clear that it would not have been something that the apostles uh, or any of the sound teachers would have wanted included right next to the Gospels and Paul's letters and even the book of Revelation. Even though there is angelic material, L.A. Marzulli claimed that, and I don't know if he's meaning this about the New Testament only or the whole Bible, but he claims that the book of Enoch was quoted 70 times in the Holy Bible. Uh, if that could be demonstrated to be true, then obviously I would lean towards the fact that, well, it was influential, whatever it was. It was definitely something the Jews listened to and were into, but uh, the church never accepted Enoch as in the canon, except for one or two cases of some people that tried to get it put in there. Um, but everybody kind of recognized that, that it says some stuff that goes against Jesus and goes against uh, the, the biblical revelation. So, again, while I, there's some cool details in there, but I tell Christians it's like the Lord of the Rings, right? Many people read the Lord of the Rings or the Hobbit, and there's some very questionable material in there, but there's also some very cool fantasy or well-written whatever that's kind of, you know, has some moral lessons, but it's not Scripture and never should be treated as such. And I think that's why all the details that Enoch gives about any of these things, I don't, I don't know that we can trust him. I don't believe we can. So, but yes, I, I would watch for a future development in the church where they will be... I could definitely see them publishing a Bible soon that would have Enoch in it. Uh, the Catholic Bible has the Apocrypha in it, which has a lot of books that were, would also, when you read those, it's very clear that they're not from the same Holy Spirit. Um, so I think we're a very short time away from some ministry publishing the, the Watcher's Bible or something with Enoch in it. I would say definitely stay away from it. Anybody else? Okay, good. Let's go listen to John's tail end because he's doing, a, he's doing Jacob Prash uh, tag team teaching. And I think he's going to be doing it for 15 to 20 more minutes. So I don't know if anybody wants to go in there. We can do that. But... Uh, Close in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the book of Jude. Thank you for just the accounts and the biblical history lessons that we can get here by way of reminder of how important it is to fight hard for the faith and to not compromise or give in to the lies of the false teachers. Father, I do pray that you will protect FBC. I pray that you would uh, just help us to realize and recognize deception when it rears up here. And God, let us be always on the watch to shepherd and guard God's people. Father, I pray that each one of us will take personal responsibility to get into the Word of God, to exercise our discernment, to be able to tell between good and evil and what is from you and what is not, to test the spirits, to see what manner they are of, Lord, and, and whether they conform to what your Word says, not what all of these other writings and all of these uh, uh, attacks on the truth down through the centuries, even the ones that are becoming popular today. We need to be so careful and discerning with what we get into. Father, I thank you for this church and their willingness to hear uh, some very straightforward things from your word. And God, may you never stop telling us the truth because you love us so much. We know you won't do that. We know that it is not even in your nature possible for you to uh, entertain darkness or be deceived yourself. We thank you for the truth of your word and for Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.